ahead and get screen shared. Please let me know if you can't see something or if you cannot hear me. I wanna make sure that everyone is good to go. Let me know if you can't hear me. There are a lot of you on the screen today. So if there are questions, if I, if I miss a hand, um, my, my team, if you can just let me know, like, hey, Danielle, you're missing a person and kind of watch the chat a little bit, but we're gonna hop right in today. Thank you for joining me. Um, our topic is implicit bias. So we're going to, for those that maybe know the topic, we'll be honing what you know. For those that have never seen or heard or been a part of the topic, I look forward to imparting some wisdom on this particular topic this morning. You'll see on the intro slide that I am your conversation catalyst for the day. Uh, those of you that have done workshops with me before know exactly what I mean by conversation catalyst, but a little background with that term. We have an organization right here in Wichita, Kansas, because that is where I'm hailing from this morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone, um, from the Kansas Leadership Center. And they believe in educating and having conversation catalysts out in the community. And that catalyst meaning an event or person that causes great change. And so I'm sure there are a number of catalysts right here um, individually and both organizationally um, represented in this space. But with diversity, equity, and inclusion topics, change is important and being a catalyst of that change is important. And so my hope today is that you will be sparked in some way to be a catalyst of change within your organization and in the places and spaces you inhabit. That said, I'd like to also share just a couple of ways for us to engage today, some engagement guidelines. Please feel free to utilize these guidelines in the conversations that you continue. What we know is that just attending a workshop alone isn't the change. Um, you'll get the education, you'll have some great discussions today, but it's what you do when we log off today, what you implement and how you engage moving forward with the information that you receive. So my hope is that you all will engage when we log off today. That being said, facilitators or myself, your conversation catalyst, I reserve the right to halt discussion and maintain order. I've been a part of a number of discussions where folks are diametrically opposed and on just total opposite sides of an issue. But what I've appreciated is the ability to maintain respect within that dialogue. So you might not agree with what I have to share today, but my hope is that we maintain order and respect in our discussion and in this learning environment. Be present and respectful in the space. Some of us are still dealing with a hybrid sort of situation. So you may be um, here with us from home with as a caregiver, pets, children, all types of stuff going on in the background. Maybe you have multiple screens up I ask that we quiet our phones, we minimize our additional screens and we lean in to engaging with one another for the brief time that we have today. So please be as present as you possibly can. We're gonna lean into discomfort because what we believe is in the space of discomfort is an opportunity for growth. If you're in a place in space where you're comfortable and you're not challenging yourself, I ask you, how are you growing? wait, why am I talking? Why am I not talking? Some folks need a little bit more time. Maybe you're more of an introvert. Um, I ask that if you are more of an introvert that you feel free to lean in to discomfort today in your small discussions as we move forward. Our extroverts are folks that can just share all day. I ask that you wait a moment, right? Just so we can let other voices chime in today where they can. One mic, one person speak at a time. One of my personal favorites, land the plane. Um, again, we're gonna treat this space as an educational space. So land the plane, ask your question, say your comment, whatever that may be, because we are going to assume good intent in our discussions today and in this topic today. While that sometimes can be hard, we wanna be able to really uh, get the opportunity to engage. So we wanna assume good intent. Also remembering though, freedom of speech is not freedom from consequence. You still may offend or step in it, that does happen. And in that case, an apology goes a long way with the willingness to change the behavior and the action, right? An apology for apology's sake doesn't mean much, but the ability to continue to educate yourself so you don't continue to make that same mistake or say that same hurtful thing means a lot in this particular work. Stories stay, lessons leave. My hope is that you get a chance to share a little bit about yourself. And in doing so, we can't um, go around sharing each other's stories, but let's walk away from the principles and the ideals we can learn from one another, the missteps, the mistakes, and the successes. Let's learn from one another in this space. And then lastly, I've said it several times, be respectful and we can agree to disagree. Please feel free to utilize 
these conversational expectations in your spaces. Um, this list has come from other lists, so this is not proprietary information. Feel free to utilize what you would like. So we're gonna hop right into it. I believe in um, starting with some common language. I've already said implicit bias a million times already. So for some of you, you might be wondering, well, what is that? Well, in this space, we're gonna use this particular definition. Um, you may have also heard of the term unconscious bias. So what is that? What's unconscious bias? What's implicit bias? Well, in this space, unconscious bias refers to a bias that we are unaware of and which happens outside of our control. Implicit bias refers to the same area but it might question the level to which these biases are unconscious, especially as we're beginning to have a better understanding. We're becoming more increasingly aware of the fact that we have biases and that they exist. So what's happening with these biases? Where, where are they coming from? What, what are they doing to us in our community and societies? Well, I'm certainly no brain scientist, so let me start there. I'm not a neurosurgeon, none of those things, but I can speak to how implicit bias and our brain work in tangent. So you have some pretty important pieces in your brain. Many of us know just how strong our minds work. Well, what's it doing? We have our amygdala, our hippocampus, our temporal lobe, and our media frontal cortex. These four things work in tangent. Um, your amygdala is that powerhouse processing space, that fight, flight, or freeze. If I ran up on you right now, your brain would know what to do, whether you're prepared to do something about it or not. Um, the amygdala is one of the oldest pieces of your brain. So it's been around. It knows how to um, interact and do what it needs to do in the blink of an eye in a situation. Your hippocampus forms the links to your brain. That's where your information and your memories are processed, right? Your temporal lobe integrates your sounds and words. And then that media frontal cortex, that's that empathy, emotional response, and rational thought, right? And then you have a, a lot of other very important pieces in your brain as well that work in tangent with this. But these are the parts that kind of stand out. Well, if you know someone that has maybe any brain damage in those spaces, you may encounter folks that um, don't easily lean into empathy. They might struggle with that, right? Folks with cognitive disabilities, there can be some different things going on um, in the brain. So when we think about how these processes work, we have to think about how much your brain is processing at all times. So I will ask, but I think we have some folks maybe from the medical field in this space, or maybe someone knows this in general, please do not Google the response, but how many pieces of information can your brain process unconsciously per second? You can drop it in the chat. About how many pieces of information can your brain process unconsciously per second? Who wants to take a stab at this? Don't be shy. <laughs> you can drop some numbers in. I'm gonna give it a three, two, one. Okay, I see 107. Okay, okay, unconsciously. More than you think, absolutely, right? About 11 million pieces of information is being processed per second unconsciously, right? That's a lot of information. Well, consciously, your brain can process about 40, 50 pieces of information. And I think sometimes I'm having a, a 10 piece happy meal day where about 10 pieces of information is gonna get processed for me depending on whether or not I've had my coffee. That being said, your brain is really trying to provide you those quick shortcuts, those brief pieces for you to be able to make changes, understand situations, knowing how to engage in situations when they arise. That is what your brain is used to doing for you. And sometimes it's not always right. Sometimes those biases kick in for your safety, right? But it's how we deal with the biases when they come in. Well, how does this implicit bias kind of pair with our cycle of socialization? Let me take a step back just to give you an example again of, of how powerful the brain is. How many of you all maybe have been driving or headed somewhere and maybe you're pulling up to your garage and you realize I'm meant to stop at the store. Like you just go into autopilot, you're driving, you're going to work, but you end up back at home or you end up at the bank, your mind just kicks in for you, right? Again, that is our brains just filling in the gaps. And when you're not actively thinking, when you're not actively present in your mind, it's gonna autopilot for you, right? And so that is how we have to be mindful when we show up with bias, but we can't be on autopilot at all times because when we're making decisions, when we're creating teams, when we're building boards, when we're hiring, when we're delegating resources. We don't want that automatic response 
but we want to make sure that we are taking the wheel and engaging with those around us and, and with our brain power. How many of us have um, heard of the cycle of socialization? I see some, some nods, some hand raises, right? So thinking about the beginning, the world that you are born into, a lot of folks believe that, you know, you're born into the world with a blank slate and you start to kind of get socialized, right? So you're coming into the world you don't have any blame or consciousness, guilt, right? You're just coming in and then you're starting to learn some things from the folks that are around you. So you begin to be socialized. Maybe the family members that you come in contact or you're with your caregivers or you're entered into a foster care system. So you're entered or born into a system of some sort. That system then begins to reinforce thoughts, ideas. Maybe you grow up in a church. Maybe you are homeschool, public school, private school and the culture and the value start being impressed upon your thought process. And you can start to buy into those thought processes, the things that you watch and listen to. Now in this next generation, we have social media. So you have all of these different inertias, pieces coming into your consciousness. Maybe you're getting your news from TikTok. Maybe you're getting your news from Fox, CNN, MSNBC, right? There's all these places and spaces that's informing your thought process and you may start to grow and enforce stigmas to cultures, to groups, to people, right? Your, your belief system starts to form and that can result in some dissonance. That can result in anger. It can result in pain. It really just depends on what you've learned and what you've internalized. And in that internalization, you can start to see identities as enemy versus folks that you wanna work with. And it becomes this us versus them sort of situation. So when we think about cultures and the cultures we're allowed to be around, or maybe you heard your grandma say something about a specific culture and that sticks with you. And you start to pick up on these thought processes, not with intention, but things that kind of just start to pour into you. So I want you to be reflective for a moment. I want you to think about how you were raised, your households, the things you learned. Where did your messages come from? When you think about your value system today, what did your family members, your caregivers pour into you? The organizations you were a part of? What behaviors were encouraged and supported, rewarded? What were you punished for? When you choose to date someone, when you choose to become friends with someone, when you choose an organization to be a part of, what has shaped that? And then kind of start thinking about what your biases may or may not be. So you can stay on that cycle of, the, of socialization train, right? And whatever you have learned and were taught, you then can pass that on to your family, your children, your mentees, whatever that looks like. And they can stay in that cycle of socialization. But oftentimes we try to push for folks to reframe, question, raise your consciousness. What are some things that you learned and are they actually true? What do we know versus... What do we think we know? So implicit bias also shows up individually in institutions. Oftentimes we talk about systemic and systems. Well, people make up systems, people make up institutions. So we have an individual level of bias. I'm gonna just read a little bit here for you all. Implicit bias is usually thought to affect individual behaviors, but it also influences the institutional practices and structures that we have. For example, there are institutions that adhere to certain practices that disadvantage groups of people, right? Oftentimes those are your minority, your marginalized, your underrepresented folks, but there may be forms of discrimination in that space that are today maybe unintentional or unintentional consequences that exist, but they keep people out nonetheless. So when we think about um, holding faculty meetings, if you're, if you're on a university campus or just thinking about your meetings in general, um, holding faculty meetings at a time when parents are most likely to be picking up children at a daycare, right? which again, that goes against families being able to be involved. Maybe I'm, I live in Wichita, Kansas. City council meetings are on Tuesday mornings at nine o'clock, nine to about 11. Well, those that want to be civically engaged might not be able to get off of work from that time frame. It's not an accessible time for folks to engage in the civic process. So institutional bias is usually not deliberate but continues to show up. So schedules, for example, again, just using the meeting time frame, we often establish a time when most, for faculty, times were established when faculty were mostly men married to women who stayed home with children. Thus, 
it is important to consider how past biases and current lack of awareness might create an unfriendly environment. What time are you putting meetings on the calendar? Can folks make them? When we think about the trajectory for um, women in the workplace or those that are able to bear children, if we hold them back from being able to move forward in their organization or for asking questions like, well, what's your, what's your plan for your family planning for families? Thinking about how some of those biases will show up. So before I go any further, I do want you all to have a little bit of discussion on how you experience bias. We have common language for it. Maybe you've seen or experienced bias in your workplace. So some questions for you to consider. You'll be in your groups for about eight minutes. So I ask that you all engage. But the questions are, where have you seen personal bias show up in the workplace, organizations, or spaces you frequent? Where have you seen institutional bias show up in the workplace, organizations? And how have you seen these biases be interrupted or mitigated? So personal bias, institutional bias, and what have you seen or what have you done to interrupt or mitigate the bias that you have seen or experienced? Or how have you interrupted your own biases? Have about eight minutes to engage with one another. Is everybody in a room? Um, Portia, I'm about to put her. She just joined. I might jump in and just kind of check in with the different rooms. Okay. Thank you. Mm -mm. Oh my God, Lucky's on a roll, so maybe not. <laughs> you say he's on a roll. Uh -oh. Story of his life every day. It, it could be the wind, it could be. Is it bubbles? Uh, Is it, bubbles? It, it could just be a leaf moving. Never know. How many do we have total today, Steph? Today we had, I think it's, well, I can't double check now, but I think it was like 110. Or 110. Mm -hmm. And there's 17 breakdowns. That's it. You need to start charging more, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> this is too much. North Carolina was on the line. Right, we have a couple from North Carolina. Yeah. Crazy. 17 rooms, that's insane. Can you join a room without them knowing or no? No. No. <laughs> needs to work now you're getting curious. You just want to know, don't you, Sylvia? You just want to zoom in and see how the conversations are going without interrupting. <laughs> they I'm have talk to zoom about that. Why? Why is Tracy texting us and trying to get in on? She's her missing her. us. Because she's <laughs> missing us. She yeah. needs to let the pros. Do this, we got this. I'm like, go to your conference. Get out of here, quit texting. Yeah. Are you paying attention? Are you listening? <laughs> Carl, please.
So Sylvia, the contractor just came, a gesture just came in this morning to look at the kitchen. They still haven't done anything. They're still assessing. I said, I don't want stainless steel. I want quartz. Oh, we'll have to go back and chart. We'll have to go back and see how much that costs. So in the meantime, I still have no kitchen. I hear you. We were four months without a kitchen. Four months? Oh, oh man. Lord. Oh, Lord. But no wonder. Fran. Really Fran. Implicit bias. Fran. Fran. Come on in, Fran. <laughs> you want me to put her in a room, Danielle? Please. Or just leave her in the Because uh, there's three minutes left. Yeah, that could still give her a little bit of time. Yeah, you can pop her in a room. She just has to. Stop. There she goes. Nope. She leave? Yeah, it's fine. It's because when I set it up, I um have them to automatically go to their breakout rooms. Okay, got it. Ow, no, lucky. Okay, uh, Sylvia. Just the FYI. Uh, Mike and mom just fell out laughing when they read their boxes and, and we sat and ate in the front room last night. But Mike said, you know, I think I want to get a black lab. I'm like. Hey, tell him to talk to me. Just don't go to the same breeder we went to because <laughs> Satan here. I don't think he's full. Uh, oh. I think he's half heathen. He's not a heathen. He just a big baby. Like who? who He's who, a who, pandemic who. dog, and he doesn't know how to act outside of this house. <laughs> he has he abandonment issues. He doesn't know how to act inside the house. He'd be running and jumping. And what's what's that? I'm gonna eat that. I want that. <laughs> I'm that. I hate when they say dogs <laughs> uh, resemble their owners because <laughs> then it makes all the sense in the world. How oh, he's crazy as me. <laughs> Lucky is funny. He's funny. I was like, oh, okay. He says, I just got to assess how much it's going to cost to keep one. But they're they're good dogs. They're smart. I'm like, they are good. They're really good with kids too. Mm -hmm. He had one growing up. So I, he's wanting one. I said, they're like having children. When you go on vacation, you got to find somebody to babysit. He's, um, yeah. he's our third. We have the chocolate lab the white lab and now we have the black lab mm. yeah we're looking at it we're looking at it and they're good protectors they will fight they'll fight you well they but no they're more like they'll bark and they sound like ferocious but as soon as you open the door and you pat their head they're like oh my god are you my best friend oh thank you for coming to see me <laughs> if you're gonna break into my house break in with a treat and They'll let you in. They'll open the door for you. Hey, come on in. They're, they're, there's some stuff over there you might like. <laughs> yeah, that's where they hide the stuff there. And that, and then if you want, I'll let me show you where the treats are kept. And that way, if you want to get a treat too, like they'll show you even all that. Oh, wow. I have one minute left. Okay. Did you see this um, message from Ken? Their company's web blocker wouldn't allow them to open. Yeah, I, I was sending them direct. Me I was sending them direct messages that it's mostly CCRC or it's like one or two agencies. And so, if they can just send their info directly to Stephanie, then we can log them or we can sign them in. Yeah. I what do you that. ask for, Stephanie? Well, it says it's a lot. So um, right now, I'm just asking. See, just since it's like I can't get everything, I'm just asking for the email, phone number, and if they didn't put the agency, the, just the title. So maybe when we come right back, maybe you can just say that real quick. Just say those of you that couldn't log into the sign-in sheet, just go ahead and you know send me a, a private message with this information, and that way you, your um, assistance attendance today will count, and I'll log oh. in. We have uh, ten seconds. Okay. And that way they at least know that um, we can log them in. Okay. And I know it's just certain DCFS, CCRC, like some of those agencies just don't have access to. Yeah. And they should all be back now. So, Danielle, if I could just do that announcement really quick. 
So hi, everyone. If you guys are actually blocked from the link to sign in, if you guys could just private message me with your name, um, agency, title, and email, please. And, okay. and then Stephanie will make sure that you get credit for uh, attending this class today. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so we have a lot of folks on the screen. If I could just hear from maybe a couple of people on just what their dialogue was, if I can hear someone that wants to just answer the first question, where have you seen personal bias show up in the workplace organization spaces you frequent? And you can just unmute and share. Well, one thing our group talked about on social media, how people make comments and mm -hmm. give negative opinions about other people's situation. And I think the term was um, keyboard thugging. You know, you make keyboard negative thugging. comments. Yeah. You're in that queue, I like that too. I told them I'm gonna take that. And the one example I used was the recent photo cover on Vogue of Rihanna and her baby. Mm -hmm. And the fact that ASAP was standing behind her, people had so many negative things to say about that. He's a man, he should be in front. She should be behind it. What does it matter where they stand? Because it's not putting any money in my pocket. It's not paying any of my bills. So just, just people having opinions about things that don't really matter or impact their lives at all. Right, right. Thank you for that. Yeah, keyboard thugging, definitely. You know, I know, isn't that cute? <laughs> a thing, right? But that is something that can also show up from into your organization, right? You post something or someone has something to say about your family or there's a bias about your family. If you're a, a same gender couple and, and the workplace isn't very LGBTQ plus friendly and something pops up on social media. These are things that show up in our bias. Thank you for that. Uh, let me hear from one other person. What was your conversation like? One other person that might want to jump in. I'll go. Our group was a little bit quiet. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, I, th I think a lot of people are sort of struggling if they haven't had this conversation before to think of what it means. Right. Um, right. I, I'm, I'm British, as you could probably tell. <laughs> um, my company, or my, sorry, my organisation, um, sort of, uh, or a department within it, I should say, um, previously used to have a lot of their team building events revolving around um, sort of bars and pubs, um, which, and it was kind of sort of early-ish finishes, you know, finishing about sort of four o'clock um, to be able to go and do those things. Um, uh, which automatically excluded not only anyone that couldn't drink alcohol for either religious or health reasons, um, but also, you know, people that had children to pick up from school or take care of, um, you know, made it quite difficult for that. So, um, you know, when it was kind of pointed out to them um, that the, the reason why a load of people weren't going was not because they felt disengaged, but because they couldn't put themselves in that situation um they've sort of changed it and now they do things uh mid-morning that do not involve drinking so uh, um but yeah um one of the other people in my group as well also um sort of said about um lgbt um communities as well um and how that's um sort of often comes up as a subject of conversation in the mm -hmm. workplace um mm -hmm which I think my company is actually really good at, to be fair. Um, we've got a very, very diverse uh, group of colleagues, so. Awesome, thank you for that. And, and you provided some really great examples too, right? Timing of meetings and also, and when for me specifically, when you're a part of a lot of young professional groups, they tend to um, get around events that are planned around a lot of alcohol, right? And sometimes those events are not inclusive or have thought about folks that A, don't drink, for whatever reason, religious reasons, a number of reasons why someone might not wanna be in a drinking space. Not to say that you can't have events at a bar or whatever that may be, but maybe a, a healthy balance of an evening event, a morning event, an event over food, particularly when we're thinking about the growing number of vegetarian, vegan folks in our life. Are we ensuring that events, work events specifically, when we talk about networking, how can everyone get a chance to network with your executive team leadership, if you're always at one space and always at one time that maybe folks wouldn't be able to engage. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna show a quick clip again that goes into implicit bias a little bit further. Please let me know if you can't hear or see something. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. 
Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times, when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old-fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We'd never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm gonna say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting the video a day dealing with one challenge so as we think about, again, implicit bias and our thoughts of association, we make associations every day and those associations get reinforced. So how are we actively trying to get out of those particular associations? Can everybody still see my screen? See the PowerPoint? Okay. So I want you just to kind of imagine, again, this particular scene with implicit bias that's both individual and with a level of um, institutionalized bias. So imagine a middle-aged man. No, we can't see the screen. I'm sorry to interrupt. Not, oh, okay. Thank you. I was like, oh, I'm not. But you all did see the, um, the video. We saw yeah. the video, but as soon as the video ended, okay. your screen's okay. off. Okay. All right. Can you all see that? Perfect. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. Um, Imagine a scene where you are witnessing a middle-aged manager and their new employee with a young woman just out of college approaching an information, uh, or sorry, approaching a booth in the Midwestern city. It might be Wichita, I'm in a Midwestern city. So let's say this is happening in Wichita, Kansas. And the manager, highly educated, professionally dressed and Hispanic, ask the woman behind the counter for directions. Rather than giving the rather complex directions to the Hispanic executive who just asked the question, the white woman behind the counter addresses only the new employee who is also white. The response, it happens all the time, says the executive as the two walk away. She suggests that the woman in the information booth probably didn't even realize she was behaving in a subtly biased manner. For her part, the young white woman is too embarrassed to admit that she barely took note of what happened until her new boss brought that up. I use this particular experience because, and for many of us, and not just race or ethnicity, that's just this specific example, but maybe you are a woman executive and you are at the top of your organization and those under you happen to be your male counterparts and folks wanna to defer to the male counterparts in the room. Or maybe you are the bank teller of color that someone doesn't wanna work with. They would prefer to have someone else handle their affairs. Those are biases. Those are things that stand in the way of folks being able to do their jobs correctly or being able to excel in their spaces. And oftentimes those in a marginalized space, because anyone can experience bias, right? They're innate. But when we think about those that are in a marginalized space, it can keep them from being able to move forward in their organizations or even be able to have holistic opportunities, access to housing, access to promotions, access to education, right? That's how biases can be harmful when we don't realize that we're playing into them, right? We can mitigate bias. We can't totally get rid of them. It's a natural brain function, but how are we aware of our biases? 
well, how does the media reinforce this? Or how does our keyboard thug and reinforce this, if you will? Um, some of us have seen a lot of these particular photos. So this is one way for us to talk about how media plays into bias. I want you to kind of be reflective and think about what your initial thoughts are to these images. Um, we see that women and girls, um, trans women across the country, across the world disappear every day. But we tend to see certain faces uplifted most often. And what does that face look like? How do we share those stories? How does media play and shape this role? So on the left or the right side of your screen, you might see Gabby Petito, for those of you um, that are really interested in that particular story. This was a case where a young woman had went missing, very popular, uh, made several videos on Instagram, um, really detailing her travel across the country in a small van with her partner. Ultimately, she went missing. And when we think about how much coverage that case received with also folks from TikTokers across the country and social media gurus across the country were working to help find this particular young woman. Well, when we think about the native indigenous women that were also missing in Wyoming, how much highlight do those women get on their daily disappearances? Ultimately, Petito's body was found because everyone really got into the mix to find her, but how many folks are in the mix to find the women of color that are missing and abused every day? At a press conference, Joseph Petito, the father of Gabby, um, thanked everyone who put the spotlight on his daughter's disappearance, but reminded the audience about all missing persons deserving the same attention. He said, I quote, I wanna ask everyone to help all the people that are missing and need help. He said, it's on all of us, everyone that's in the room to do that. And if you don't do that, other people will continue to go missing. And it's a shame because it's, Gabby is not the only one that deserves it. Um, just a quick report, according to the um, report published in Wyoming, 710 indigenous people, mostly young girls, went missing in Wyoming from 2011 to 2020. They also found about 85% of them were missing children. 57% were female. Of the state's 23 counties, indigenous people have been reported missing in 22 of them with barely any media coverage outside of local publications. There's an estimate of about 64,000 black women and girls missing across the US. Um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children estimate about 613,000 people reported missing in the U.S. Of that number, about 60% of those people are people of color. So when you think about the amber, amber alerts and atom alerts in your communities, what do they look like? What do they sound like? Who are we looking for? Another, um, again, same news station highlighting a burglary but how these burglars were highlighted, vastly different. You have um, college young men, fraternity young men, right? Their headshots were used. Um, and then right next to them, again, another arrest of four men. Just look, I mean, look at it for yourselves, how oftentimes news portrays people. Well, what's the bigger issues here when we think about what is happening. Um, Harry Kang, a legal scholar and former UCLA vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion, has a study on what's going on in our media. And his um, study is called Bits of Bias. And in that, he talks specifically about the, um, the media and how they showcase the negative experiences of people to really get the clicks, the likes, the sales, to keep people engaged. So he really um, highlights in a research paper, Implicit Bias Across the Law. This research paper happened in 2011. He states, local news programs often showcase violent and sensational crime stories. Um, the Pew Project for Excellence in Journalism, that study showcased that in local newscasts, it spends about 25% of their time on just crime stories. So, right, if it bleeds, it leads. Think about your own news stories in your community and think about all the bias that's built in that space. Well, let's take it a step further. Um, there was a study done on um, underrepresented victims on television news. So Travis Dixon and Daniel Lins examined local news. This might be in your area, Los Angeles and Orange Counties in California. They computed differentials between television crime rates and real world crime rates. Well, what did they find? Um, Blacks are portrayed as victims of homicide only 23% of the time, whereas their victimization rate was 28%. 
whites were portrayed as victims 43% of the time on the news, although their actual victimization rate was 13%. On the perpetrator side, TV news portrayed blacks as usual perpetrators 36% of the time, although the actual arrest rate percentage for blacks were 21%. These are very skewed numbers. And this doesn't even highlight how often do you hear of other cultures on the news. Oftentimes we're not seeing native indigenous, Asian, multiracial, Hispanic, unless we're talking immigration. And then certain populations will populate on that screen when we're telling the stories of our communities. I say that when we think about socialization, what are we absorbing and what are we believing and running with? Just take some time to kind of consider and think about how bias shows up in your everyday life and how you are having to actively mitigate and combat those biases, when we're being bombarded all day from news breaks on our phone, social media, TV screens, whatever that may be. So organizations are starting to embrace bias mitigation. So we'll utilize um, Facebook as an organization. Sometimes I question how well they're doing it outwardly, but inwardly, this is what they're saying they're doing. And they have ran some studies. So from that, um, if you've ever taken the implicit association test, this is a bias test that you can take. Um, and it tells you um, what you may have biases in. I do tell folks you need to be mindful of the bias implicit test that you take um, because we need to understand that we all have bias. The first step in moving forward with bias is knowing that you have them and understanding how you mitigate them. And then you may have more biases for a group than others. So here it says about 76% um, were more readily, would more readily associate males with career and females with family. This is some of the information that's coming out of Facebook. 70% more readily associate males with science and females with the arts. 75% of the respondents said they have an implicit preference for white people over black people um, with disabilities. 76% have a preference for able-bodied people, right? So our preference to lean into majority over minoritized, marginalized, underrepresented groups. So how does performance bias show up or gender bias? So I have a couple of case studies just to review here. Case study one, US orchestras revealed women's odds of making it past the first round of auditions increased with 50% blind auditions. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, case study two, study of identical resumes, one with a man's name and one with a woman's name found that 79% of applicants with a man's name versus only 49% of those with a woman's name were worthy of hire. This is name, name sounding female or male. Um, so what do we do about gender neutral names, right? That's a whole other conversation. Case study three, mothers overestimate their son's crawling ability compared to their daughter's crawling ability. So how are we preferencing even at home? So when we think about doing gender blind studies, well, what do we mean by that when we're hiring? Um, this might sound a little crazy, but in the 1950s, orchestras were looking at ways to get more women into the orchestra, more uh, female musicians into the orchestra. So they realized at that time they had conductors hand-picking musicians, right? And anytime you're hand-picking someone, you know that there's bias there, generally. But these conductors were hand-picking people that they were proximate to. Well, when you're proximate and your network looks the same, you're going to funnel the same type of people into your organizations, into your leadership. So they decided to do blind auditions, meaning they would put a screen up so they weren't able to see the musician, but they're able just to hear the music coming from that musician. Well, they noticed, well, there was a little bit of change in our women joining our orchestras, but not as large of a change as they thought. So they took a step back and realized, we can tell when a woman is on the other side of this um, partition because we can hear the clicking of their heels in the hallway. By virtue of having these women take their shoes off or wear more quiet shoes, they did not, they weren't able to tell truly then at that point who was on the other side of the screen and because they did blind auditions, truly blind auditions, they were able to grow by 21% from 1970 to 1993 and having more women musicians in the orchestra. And orchestras don't tend to have a whole lot of high turnover. So that's a big deal to be able to get that many women influx into their organization just by making those blind 
opportunities, blinding the opportunity, right? Sometimes folks aren't even taking names any longer on applications because they want to make sure that they're looking at what uh, the resume is bringing into the space versus judging by the name of someone in the application pool. Um, performance attribution bias. So research shows that when men and women work together on tasks, women are given less credit for a successful outcome. Some of us might actually experience this um, survey of several thousand potential political candidates all with credentials to run for office found that men were 60% more likely to run than they were qualified for the actual office. There's a statistic going around that you have to ask a woman what almost 10 times to run for office before she might actually take it seriously. Um, we wanna check every box before we run for something meanwhile. And again, not trying to make overlaying statements, but when we think about how we preference or maybe uplift a majority, a majority person is gonna more likely want to be in a space, whatever majority may be, for you in your communities, your organizations. Um, at Facebook, there is a perception by some that underrepresented groups got jobs because of their commitment to diversity and affirmative action laws and qualification, right? So instead of understanding that diversity doesn't mean lack of quality, right? That means that you almost have to be overqualified to still be able to get the role. We're, we're conflating two things where we're not um, understanding what it means to actually be able to get a diverse pool of people versus preferencing a group of people. So what do these things mean? Um, impact for those that are experiencing these biases, not getting the same credit for accomplishment. Think about yourself. As I say some of these things, be reflective, less likely to receive credit for your ideas, stolen ideas, less likely to have influence in groups, interrupted more, um, given greater blame for mistakes impact for yourself, right? That's lower self-esteem. If these are the things that you're facing, many of us on this space or on this screen, regardless of your background, might be experiencing imposter syndrome, not because we're imposters, but the system makes us feel like we're the imposter. When you feel like you have this uphill battle, well, bias has lots of friends that go by other names. So we have affinity bias, right? The tendency to want to get along with those um, that are like us. And that's not innately good or bad, but it is easier for us. I said this earlier um, in the example that I provided with the Hispanic executive and the white woman assistant. They're talking to another white woman asking for directions and that white woman only speaks to the other white woman. Well, that could have been out of comfort, right? It's not that she was trying to be hurtful or hateful, but it was, I'm explaining this thing. I see someone that looks like me, there's a comfort. Many of us do it. Um, if you're a super, if you watch the Super Bowl, I come from Wichita, Kansas. So I'm a big Kansas City Chiefs fan, although Kansas City Chiefs is on the Missouri side, not the Kansas side. I'm in my Chiefs jersey. I'm probably going to walk up to the other person in the Chiefs jersey, right? That's our affinity bias. But it's when we exclude the other team from being in the space, when we keep them from resources, that's when affinity bias becomes problematic. That's when in-group favoritism, when we favor groups. So oftentimes we'll hear groups or HR organizations say, we hire the same type of person. Well, Look at your HR department. What could be going on in that space that you're bringing on the same people? Who's doing the hiring? Who's doing the interview? Who's on the interview panel? What's on the job description? What are the things that you're asking for? That's where you kind of get those biases mitigated in those spaces. When we have confirmation bias, when we only listen to those that agree with us, we see it on social media all the time. You can hit the block button quick, right? How many of us or how many of us know people that only watch Fox News? They only listen to MSNBC. They only fool with Don Lemon. They only, right? There are folks that are looking for that confirmation of their own thoughts or ideas, so much so that we'll go into defensive attribution. We get defensive when folks say that we're wrong. And so we'll find all the statistics that back up only our statements. It's important for us to be able to listen across network. It's important for us to challenge our own thoughts and biases because remember that cycle of socialization. Not everything you were taught was true. Right, there's the education that you receive and the education you have to learn on your own. Carter G. Woodson, the father of Black History Month, states that we have to seek two educations, one of which that we receive and one that we seek out on our own. Other biases, proximity bias. And you can check this out. Um, this is adapted by the 60-year catalyst. There's a whole list um, when we favor those that are around us. So some of us working in a hybrid space, don't forget about the folks that are tuning in on the screen versus those that work right next to you. When you're in the office with one another all the time and you build these relationships and you can see the fruits of someone's labor, 
you may be more excited to promote this person because you see them and you know what they're doing all the time versus this kind of hybrid nature where maybe I don't see Fran as much in the workplace. I know she's doing her job, but we don't have as much rapport because she works in California and I'm in Kansas, but we were hiring folks in a hybrid capacity. So how are we being equitable? Ageism, right? So discriminating against someone on the basis of their age and ageism tends to affect women more than men. Beauty bias, this is a real thing, right? When sometimes when you look at people's executive teams, when people are hiring based off of a look that they want, uh, Melody Hobson talks about beauty bias in some of her work. Check out Melody Hobson. She has a TED talk called Color Brave, Color Bold, but she speaks to what beauty bias can do. Com conformity bias, right? Very common in a group setting. This type of bias occurs when your views are swayed or influenced by the views of others. Group think happens in our organization all the time. I already kind of spoke about gender bias. The halo horns effect, the tendency to put someone on a pedestal or think more highly of them after learning something impressive about them or conversely perceiving someone negatively after learning something unfavorable about them. We've seen this in some spaces where someone absolutely um, loves a candidate, but then they find out, ooh, they have an arrest record. And you didn't know what that arrest record was, but now you have colored your thought process about them because you saw something. But if that arrest record has nothing to do with the job at hand, if it's not, if, if you're working in a children's space, and they have a child crime, that's one thing, right? We, there is some things that we have to be mindful of. There are laws and practices in place, but if they stole a candy bar from the Walmart <laughs> and, you're, and we're holding that against them and they made a, a poor decision at, at a young age and that's on their record, but we don't wanna give them a job or an opportunity. If we don't ban the box for some of the folks that have felonies that have worked to reform their lifestyle. And we also know the criminal justice system is biased. So sometimes, crimes are charged and folks didn't do those crimes, we are keeping them from being able to have an excelling successful life in our own communities. Name bias, we talked about how that shows up on resumes, um, keeping people from uh, being a part of the workforce. Maybe we're intimidated and we can't pronounce their name and then we wonder if they speak English or not. We have some organizations though that lean into the diversity of names and look for folks that speak two or three languages and place them in those communities so that they can be a resource, right? I think about um, one of the banks that we have, they're looking for that diversity. They need more Spanish speakers. So they're placing them in our communities like Dodge City and some of those other places where that language is needed and spoken. So I'm looking for someone that's reflective of that community to help move our work forward. Weight bias, judging a person negatively because they are larger or heavier than average. So we see those things, and I even hate to say than average, right? Body type, um, those that are a part of our transgender community making assumptions and keeping people out of jobs, communities, homes because of the biases that we carry and hold. So what do we need to do about that? Well, we have to mitigate bias. I'm going to see if this comes up. Can everybody see that? I'm gonna play. Yes, we can see it, Danielle. Let's look at how to measure bias in ourselves and in others. Here's Dolly Chu from NYU. We sent emails to real professors in real universities. They contacted over 6,500 professors at random from 260 American universities. We sent them an email that looked like it came from a real person asking for a meeting to learn more about the PhD program in that university. But we randomly assigned whether the, the fictional person sending that email had a name that sounded male or female and sounded white, Chinese, Hispanic, Indian, or black. What we found that is if you were a white male, you were far more likely to receive a response back than if you were in all those other categories put together as a group. Some of this could be explicit racism, but it's far more likely that in many cases, these professors are just busy. They can't respond to every email they get. So they kind of let their subconscious decide for them. And that's where their biases come through. Research shows that our racial biases are often more about who we choose to help than who we don't. And we tend to help people who are similar to us. But you aren't 6,500 randomly selected professors. So how can you figure out where you might be making similar unconscious choices? 
First, there's a well-known test online you can take that can help show you biases you hold. Or just do an audit. Whatever data you have, whether it's formal data in a computer or whether it's just data that's sort of anecdotal, look at the data. For example, I met this fantastic executive in Silicon Valley. He takes great pride in being someone who actively tries to achieve gender balance on his teams, knowing that Silicon Valley and tech are skewed heavily male. So he looked at his professional social network, his Twitter, his LinkedIn. He found his network was far more skewed male than he expected. So there is a place where he could actively work to shift that, and that's what he's been doing since then. So this is not a scientifically exact self-audit, but it can still be useful, and you can audit anything. So maybe start by taking that online test for bias. Maybe check out whose emails you're replying to. But you can also audit yourself for implicit bias by asking a friend to observe you in the real world. If you're a teacher, have people look at who you call on most in class. Whatever your interactions are. One practical thing that people should do is take stock of their friends. It would be very useful for people to actually make lists of people with whom they spend time. Look for patterns. That's the audit. That's the assessment we can all do. All right. Now again, that doesn't mean that you are doing the friend quota, right? So let's just also be mindful. But it's an opportunity for you to get an understanding of who do you spend time with, who are you around, how can you mitigate your biases or bring your biases to your consciousness because it's happening all the time. So. How do we mitigate? Think about your institutional policies and practices. What's going on there, right? Small policy changes can make big changes within your organization. What's promotional timelines look like? Um, what are those conflicts that we see? Interview practices, traditions. Um, we're going through choir attendance at institutional functions on religious holidays. Are you mindful of the cultures that are on your job so that you can ensure that, hey, this is that Ramadan is going on. How can we be mindful of that? How are we mindful of the different cultures that are within our organization and not just those that identify as the Christian cultures that oftentimes our holidays are circled around? Um, when we are reviewing the welcoming and the belonging side of our organizations, how welcoming are we to women, people of color, people of different sexual orientation, people of different gender identities? What's going on there? How are we checking in across community? Are we uh, friendly to those with disability? When we think about the uh, things that we might need on the job to make sure that things are accessible for the people that we're hiring, reviewing those practices and policies are gonna be very helpful to the mission and vision of your organization. Also, when we think about the equity lens, how are we looking at things through the glasses of equity? And what is that? Intentional inclusion in decision and policy making. The focus on both the process and the outcomes. When you review your policies, when sometimes someone says, Daniel, well, what do you mean by review policies? Well, actually look through those policies, look through your handbooks, look through your documents, look through your board documents, whatever that is, and find out the outcomes of said policies. What are you trying to achieve? When you're sitting around the policy making table, who's affected? Oftentimes when you're looking to center underserved or marginalized populations, you need those folks at the table that you're creating policies for. And we see equity starting to come into the public health system, our school systems, corporate and nonprofit spaces. These are ways for us to engage. Maybe you're asking yourself some of the following questions. What's the landscape? What's the social political landscape in your areas? What are the equity issues? What do we need to address? What should be considered when we're addressing these things? How does the larger historical and socio-political environment show up right here in Kansas um, we're looking at the protection of LGBTQ plus rights. Well, I also live in a space where our legislature is putting up trans, anti-trans bills all the time. I'm not trying to get into people's politics, but I'm just saying when we look to um, want to have folks attracted to coming, living and working and playing in Kansas, if folks see policies that are anti their identity, why would they come here to work, live or play? When we see uh, legislation against people's identities, why would you go there? Why would you choose those organizations, those spaces? Your personal lens, how might your own intersectional social identities and biases affect how you see an issue? What are your biases at the table when you're creating policies, when you're hiring, when you're promoting? What are the things that you're experiencing or saying? And how 
might others in a, intersectional social identities and biases affect how they're seeing issues? Maybe your religious values might keep you from wanting to work with a certain population, but how is that, how is that equitable when we're trying to ensure that folks have a home when you're providing loans, right? There's all these laws and policies, but if you let your personal politics or values stand in the way, you may be keeping someone from a basic need, clean air, water, some of those things, your biases to act in a community that might have contaminated water. Are you not acting because you don't care about that community or you feel like they don't deserve to have those things? These are the ways that public policy can hurt and shape the people that we work alongside. We have to read the room, folks. Are we reading the room when we're in these meetings? Whose voices and experiences are being included or highlighted? or lack thereof, if you're always invited in the room, who's missing? If you're the only one in the room, who should you be inviting? Are the people being impacted, included in the decision-making processes? Are the voices and perspectives being heard? We always love to put dollars in the hands of those that need them the most, but are we putting in the resources to ensure that they're able to be successful when they get the resources that they need? Do the folks that we're working alongside have power? Who has the power? Is it the elected? Is it the CEO? Is it the board members? Is it our entry level? Who has the power and what are the power dynamics at play? Who is a part of the decision-making process and who is addressing the situations at hand? And how are we addressing those situations? Whose cultural norms, values, and standards and perspectives are reflected in processes, in actions and decisions, right? Sometimes we do things because we're like, oh, you know, this we're gonna fund this particular activity and it will be great, but we've not thought about all the processes. How does someone get those funds? If I have to give you my birth certificate, my blood test, if you need to run my, my background, understand my taxes, is the money accessible for the people that need it if they have to turn in a million documents? How are we making ac access to resources equitable? And then impact. How might the action, decision, service, or policy affect people with different social identities? So what's the impact of decisions that you're making? How is bias impacted by those decisions? Does this action increase a sense of belonging and access, again, resources, opportunities, power for people from underrepresented or marginalized groups, or whoever might need the support? Um, how might this action unintentionally advantage people from a dominant group versus disadvantage, right? Again, equity. Sometimes people need a little bit more help. Some folks don't need help at all. So how are we actually um, getting the support and the resources to the people that need the support and the resources and not wasting resources by giving it to folks that don't need it? Um, what are some ways to ensure equitable impact or outcomes are happening and changes are being sustained? And this is something that I always like to tell folks when you set the expectation, again, we're, we're talking about equity and we're talking about implicit bias and that all plays into the equity, diversity and inclusion work that we should be engaged in. So it starts at recruitment and it's showcased in your retention. If you were here with me last time, um, you might've saw this slide. It's important just to be reminded are you ready for the diversity that you're seeking? What are the biases that need to be checked in your organization and in your culture's organization before you start recruiting folks? Are you prepared? Because you will lose the diversity that you're trying to gain. What are your interview questions looking like? What's the performance-based notes that you're taking um, from recruitment to retention to promotion? What's upward mobility look like for organizations? What's your evaluation criteria? Sometimes it's about mentorship matching or growing your employee networks? What are the accommodations that are needed in your organization so you can better work with folks? The other piece is for us to consider the network gap. Again, this is also what shows up in our bias. CNBC just did an article not too long ago about professional networks. It says the article indicates that somewhere between 50 and 80% of jobs are secured by networking. Most people in today's job market must leverage their network and who they know in order to even get their foot in the door. Given the increased importance of these social networks, it's imperative to understand how our networks can further drive inequality. I think about how I got my job. I knew a lot of board members. I worked hard, don't get me wrong, but I also understand my privilege. I'm born and raised here in Wichita, Kansas. I know a number of people and knowing people will get you where you need to go. And it's who knows you, right? So from the zip code, a child is born into the post-secondary institution institution or lack thereof. 
that some attends to their first and second and third job. Every experience an individual has impacts the professional connections within their reach. Think about the zip code you were born into and what that means for you, your access. Are you in a food desert? Are you experiencing food apartheid? Do you have access to medical? Do you have, your zip code can dictate how far you go. And when we have a heavily redlined country, what does that mean for where you can go and what you can do and what your networks look like? So I think about tackling bias um, and, and as cliche as that might be, who, who are your friends? What's your proximity? How strong do you believe your networks are? Who are you proximate to? Who do you engage with? So studies were done on um, college students in dorms and they found um, some interesting information. So in this study, white students and black students were placed in dorms together. And then they also watched their counterparts or studied the counterparts where they kept um, those with the same racial and ethnic background in dorms together as well. Those who were placed in the dorms with higher racial and ethnic diversity where they were matched with someone that had a different um, racial ethnic background, they noticed a considerable decrease in bias by virtue of being in a room with someone that was of different racial ethnic background from them. Those that were in rooms with those that had the same background had stayed the same course of their bias level. So that speaks to our ability to be able to build relationships with one another and break down any of the stereotypes that we may have built up because we know someone of a different culture so much so that we call that person a friend so we can actually get to the background and the heart of those that we want to engage with. Cultural humility will always be at the end of my workshop because that is something that we always have to lean into a lifelong commitment to learning and critical self-reflection, a desire to understand and fix power and balances, and then taking institutional and personal responsibility, right? Mutual respect and partnership goes a long way to building trust, but it's really important for us to understand how we're holding ourselves accountable and getting the appropriate education, right? Knowledge, confidence, and self-efficacy is a part of cultural humility and being able to engage with other cultures. So I want you just to kind of, again, be reflective as I come towards the end of our workshop today in order to create change around bias. It must be seen. You have to see bias. We have to be intentional with it. There were intentional policies on the books that kept people out of housing areas, right? There are intentional laws on the books. So intention is important. When you read something that says Jewish folks can't live here, Black folks can't live here, um, this person can't use a bathroom, we're intentionally naming a thing. So in order to break down that thing, we have to be intentional in the work to reverse and break the silos that have been put in place. So what are those systems and structures? Take the temperature of your work environment. The, work, the places that you work, live and play now, what's the temperature? Is your environment exclusive and hostile? Do colleagues feel a sense of belonging at every level? How are issues and complaints handled? Are the issues and complaints handled swiftly? Are your processes for handling issues and complaint, complaints reactive or proactive? Are you building a space where folks can belong or are you putting out fires? So how can you be intentional with bias mitigation? Um, some resources out there, Blind Spot is a really good bit, hidden biases of good people, bias undercovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see and think, erasing institutional bias, how to create systemic change for organizational inclusion, and I will uh, make sure that you all have access to some of these slides so you all can continue the work, right? Because I said, once we log off today, the work is now in your hand. Um, my apologies that today wasn't as interactive with lots of breakouts, but I wanted to make sure that you all got a good understanding of implicit bias. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to inclusivegf at gmail.com or get with the amazing Best Art team to get any of your needs met from me. Thank you all for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. This is very informative. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Yeah, very informative. Hey, Steffi, can you pull up the last uh, slides? I just saw a few announcements. Yes, let me put that.
before you go, just wanted you to have a few information, just a little bit of information for our next session, which will be taking place on March the 3rd. And we will co-create a multi-generational workforce. That's what our next topic will be. And that will get, again be March 3rd. Next slide, please. Thank you for joining us and we hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy yourself, be safe out there and we'll see you next month. Bye everyone. Make sure you signed in as well. Thank you very yeah. much. God bless you all. Bye -bye. God bless America. Amen. Oh yeah. Thank you. Bye friend. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, everybody. Thank I finally you. got in. Brad, we got to stop meeting this way. <laughs> hey, Miss Friend, I miss you. Oh, hi, sweetheart. I miss you too. I had a problem best. with my computer this morning, but I figured it out somehow. So I got in after all. Thank you very, very much. Very, very much. Good you to know, see you again. Been. It's same here. I've learned a lot, and I'm, you know, me. I'm out in the world there with everybody and my advocacy yes, for you are. seniors and advocate and disabled. And I appreciate what you're doing for all of us. Thank you very much. You're awesome, friend. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend, weekend everyone. Let's go, guys. Bye, friend. Bye, bye. Okay. Monica, I left her a message. Thank you, sweetheart. Bye, bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Bye, everyone. <laughs>